Okay. Uh, all right, let's start. Okay, we continue. That let's let's start from last time. All right. So, so we were talking about linear regression last time, right? And um, the uh, one of the things we can do with linear regression is that it doesn't have to be the model doesn't have to be linear. Uh, you can still use least square methods to solve linear regression. Uh, you can use these sort of methods to solve nonlinear models, right? So one of the things I said is, look, um, you know, if, if y is equal to beta x plus e, now that's a linear model, but it doesn't have to be linear. It can be nonlinear. So in order to make this model nonlinear, what you can do is you can fit something like this, right? You can beta 1 x plus beta 2 x squared plus e, right? So this is a quadratic polynomial model. And now it looks simple, but when I, when I go from here to here, right? Remember, I only have one x, right? I only have one x. And now I turn it into two things. One is x, one is x squared, right? So one thing to understand is, is we are doing a feature transform when we're doing this, okay? Now recall last time when I said, what is feature transform, right? What is feature? Feature transform is, uh, if I have y equal to beta x plus e, last time I gave you the example that I can turn x into log x, right? I can turn x into log x. If I turn x into log x, that's called feature transform. If I turn y, right? So if I turn y into log y, that's called target transform, right? So anything you change x, it's a feature transform. You change y, it's a feature, it's a target transform. So what we're doing here when we go from linear to quadratic model is I'm actually doing a feature transform. I'm transforming x into z, okay? I'm transforming x into z. And what is z? Z is x transforming one dimensional x into a two dimensional x squared. So that is called a feature transform, okay? Feature transform. So one way to think about polynomial models, it is essentially a feature transform that we're doing. All right? Now, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we, we don't necessarily have to do a, a sort of a, you know, a simple polynomial model. We can do what? We can do piecewise constant, right? So last time when I finished the lecture, we we're talking about piecewise constant. Uh, what is piecewise constant? Well, uh, okay. So the ideal of piecewise regression is that any time you do, any time you fit a model, right? So if you fit something like this, like y equal to beta x, what you're doing is you're doing a global regression. So regardless of the value of x, you are fitting the same relationship, right? So that's that's a global one. But we don't have to be we don't have to be global. We can go local, right? Local means I can divide my x into several regions, one, two, three, three regions, and I'm going to fit a different relationship on each region, okay? The simplest re relationship is a piecewise constant. So piecewise constant is simply to fit a constant here, fit a constant here, fit a constant here, okay? That's a, that's a piecewise constant. Now the piecewise constant regression looks like this, right? It, you know, there's a constant, 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 looks simple, but what I'm trying to get here is a piecewise constant, how do we actually fit, right? How do we actually find the uh, final beta value? Well, the value of the constant here is very simple because it's a constant. So in this region, you simply average the y value and what you get, you basically get the constant, okay? So that's the simplest way to do it. But there's another way to write it, okay? There's another equivalent way to write it, which is I'm going to define, okay? So, so this is my x, x uh, you know, this is my x variable. I'm going to define, suppose I cut it, right? I, I can cut my x range into three parts, and I'm going to define, okay, three functions, v1, v2, v3, okay? I'm going to define three functions, and each function is going to be a zero, one step function, right? So v1 is equal to, equal to one only in this region. So it's only going to be one in this region, and then it's going to be zero. So v1 looks like this. v2 is only going to be one in this region, and a zero otherwise. So v2 look like, you know, look like this, okay, v2 look like this, and the v3 is, you know, something like that, right? So once I define these three functions, okay, I can simply run a regression. I can simply write my model as y equal to beta 1 v1 plus beta 2 v2 plus beta 3 v3, right? Beta 3 v3. Okay, and that's my new model. That's my new model. And I can solve this model by what? By least square regression. Same thing as before, right? Because we, you can just treat this phi as the new x we have, all right? And this is what? This is feature transform. Essentially, what we're doing is feature transform. We're essentially transforming, transforming my x 
into a new feature, which is called a Z, okay, which is called Z. And what is Z? Z here is phi1, phi2, phi2, and phi3, okay? Phi1, phi2, phi3. And I simply write my new, so my new model, okay? My new model is basically y equal to beta z plus e, okay? But this beta has many, many beta, right? You know, well, essentially beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, okay? Beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. Right, so, no, to be more precise, okay? To be more precise. So how do I solve this beta? Beta hat equal to z prime z inverse z prime y, right? But, to, you know, the least square regression formula. So we turn a non, essentially we make a nonlinear model. The model is nonlinear, right? Okay. The model is nonlinear, but we make it into a linear form. How do we do that? We do it through feature transform. We transform our x, okay? We, we, we have a nonlinear model in x, but we turn x into a z, and then we write it this way, so it's a linear model, we can solve it using least square. Right? It's essentially the same idea behind, you know, behind this graph where, okay, where you know the, the, this is the this is the relationship between x and y, right? X is your feature, the original data, y is your you know y is your output, and then they look something like this, right? And what you can do is you can transform your x. So because if you run if you run a model x y, it has to be a highly nonlinear model. In fact, it's actually the underlying model is a sign, right? Now what you can do, you can transform your x into a sine x. So you can basically try to, so basically trans transform your x into a z, and a z is equal to sine x, right? And then if you plot z here and y here, it's a linear relationship, okay? It's a linear relationship. So transfer, so you do a trans feature transform, and then you turn into a linear model, right? So that's what we're doing, okay? So of course, um, it doesn't have to be piecewise constant, right? So piecewise constant is just one way. So let's take a look at the uh, at this graph, right? So here the blue curve is the underlying relationship. It's the underlying target function, right? Target function. And I'm going to do is I'm going to fit, I'm going to break into three regions, and I'm going to fit a constant here, a constant here, a constant here, right? The green line is the constant fit. That's called piecewise, that's a piecewise constant, right? It doesn't have to be constant, but it doesn't have to be constant, right? It can also be a linear one. I can make, you can make it look, I can make it look like this, okay? It's a linear one, right? So I fit a linear curve here, linear curve here, linear curve here. That's a piecewise linear model, okay? Or we also call it linear spline, okay? It's a linear spline, okay? That's another name, but it's basically piecewise linear model. So this piecewise linear model doesn't look that nice because it's, because it's discontinuous here. There's a huge jump, right? So meaning that if you go from here to here, your predicted value of y, your prediction of y suddenly changes at this cut point. Now, for piecewise constant, it also suddenly changes, but there's nothing you can do about piecewise constant. For linear, we can do something. Okay? We can try to make the value here at the boundary the same, okay, the same. So I try to connect these two points, and I try to connect these two points. Okay. So basically, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make these green curve connected with each other. So I'm going to fit a linear curve here, linear curve here, linear curve here, but I'm going to make them connect in the middle. So how do, how do I do it? Well, imagine, okay, imagine I, I only have one cut point, okay? I only have one cut point, so we have two regions. If I have only two regions, then my piecewise linear regression basically has this form, okay? Y is equal to alpha is one zero plus alpha one one x plus e. That's, the, that's in the first region. The second region is alpha two zero, alpha two one, x minus c. The c is the cut point, okay? It's the cut point, plus c, right? So this, these are the two linear curves, okay? These are the two linear lines and I'm going to make them connect. So how do I make them connect? I impose a condition that at the cut point, okay, at the cut point, this line and this line must meet, okay, must meet. And how do I do that? Very simple, when x is equal to c, c is the cut point, when x is equal to c, this guy is equal to alpha one zero plus alpha one one c, right? This guy is equal to two, alpha two zero, plus this thing goes to zero, this thing goes to zero. So the condition is, alpha one zero plus alpha one one c is equal to alpha two zero, that's my condition. So as long as I impose this condition, then I have two linear curve and they're completely connected at the boundary, okay, at the boundary. Um, so if I do this, how many, how many parameters, right, how many degree of freedom do I have? By degree of freedom, I mean how many parameters do I have to estimate? Well, one, two, three, four, that's the four parameters in my original model plus a constraint. 
So once you have a constraint, you get, you get rid of one, okay? So you only have three parameters to estimate. So the degree of freedom for this model is three, right? Is three. So you can think about, so, so think about why do we do that, right? So why do we want to connect them? What's the reason I want to connect them? Well, because first of all, it looks nice. And then you, you want your prediction to be continuous. You don't want it to be, what? You don't want it to be uh, jumping around, right? But there's a, there's, a, there's a deeper reason. The deeper reason is you think that the underlying target function, the underlying target function you think should be continuous, right? Because if you believe the underlying target function to be jumping around, like a discontinuous all, all over the place, you don't need to do that, right? Okay? So because you believe the under, uh, uh, target function should be continuous, at least that's, that's what you think, you make them connect. In other words, in other words, what they're doing here is you're, force, you're, you know, you're forcing your model to behave a certain way because what? Because you bring your own knowledge, your own belief about the underlying function into your model. And you're bringing into, into your model by what? By, force, by forcing the model to be what? To be simple than before. Why? If I fit a linear curve here, linear curve, linear curve here, you know, we have how many parameters do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six. We have six parameters. Okay, so six degree freedom. But once I force them to connect at a boundary, I get, there's one condition, I get rid of one, I get rid of one here, so I have only four degree freedom. So we're reducing the degree of freedom on a model by, you know, by, by making them doing that. So you are actually reducing the complexity. Okay, you're reducing the complexity of model because why? Because you believe the underlying function should be continuous. So uh, you know you may now you may think what I'm saying is obvious, but I will, we will come back to this point again and again. Okay, we'll come back to this point again. And again. So because oftentimes what we do is that we are going to what we are going to reduce the complexity model by bringing our belief about the underlying world into our modeling. So that's that's what that's you know that's something I will come back again and again. Okay, all right. So that's piecewise linear. Now it turns out that if you solve this function, if you solve this function, this function, plus this constraint. It comes into, you know, it, it turns into a very simple one, okay? It turns into y is equal to beta 0 plus beta y x plus beta 2 x minus c plus. It turns into these three things. Now, this is just, you know, this is just, your, you know, your linear model in the, first, in the first region. This is in the second region. What is, um, what is x minus, what is x minus c plus? Like, what is this thing? Well, this is a function that, this is a function that is equal to zero, okay? That is equal to zero when x is below c, okay? When x is below this c, this cut point, but is equal to x minus c, okay? Only when x is larger than c, right? So this is something that, this is a function that is equal to zero. If x is smaller or equal to c, and it's equal to x minus c if x is above, okay? If x is above, right? So it is, you know, it is this function. It is a function look like this. It turns out that the solution basically looks like this. Okay, look at this. And this solution also suggests what? Suggests it's again a what? A linear, a linear form consisting of what? Consisting of essentially a feature transform, right? The feature transform here is what? The feature transform is I'm transforming my x into a z, okay, into a z, and the z has three components. Uh, which, sorry, only two components, okay? I'm going to forget about the, the, the interest of that one x and x minus c plus, okay? So that's going to be my feature transform. Once I do that, that's essentially, an, again, a linear function, right? A linear function, okay? Now, um, it turns out that we don't have to do piecewise linear as well, right? We can, we can go up, we go up, right? We can break our region down x into different regions, and each region, I, I can fit not only a line, but I can, I can also fit what, a, a polynomial, right? Second degree, third degree, fourth degree, whatever, right? So if we do a third degree, that's called a cubic spline. Okay. So spline, essentially, we have, you know, the title regression spline basically refers to piecewise regression. And if it's a linear spline, it's basically piecewise linear. Quadratic spline, piecewise quadratic polynomial. Cubic spline is piecewise cubic. So every region, I'm going to fit a cubic polynomial. That's called a cubic spline, okay? Now, how do you fit? Uh, so let's take a look, okay? So this is what... So this is what it looks like if you try to fit a piecewise, piecewise, you know, cubic spline. Okay, cubic spline. Now you can think, okay, so these are the data. I'm going to fit a cubic polynomial here. I'm going to fit a cubic polynomial here, a cubic polynomial here. And if you do that, you think that's very, that looks very bad. 
because they're you know they're jump they're not connected, they're discontinuous, and it looks like all over the place. So you think if you believe the underlying target function does not look anything like this, you think the underlying target function should be continuous, then you should try to connect them. Okay, just like we do for the linear model, we try to connect them at the boundary. So that's what I'm going to do. Okay, I'm going to make it connect at the boundary. But even but but then you take a look, right? If you make the green thing connect at the boundary, it still doesn't quite look nice, right? It looks something like this. Okay, so if you cannot see it clearly, it looks something like this. So in the first region, so we have three regions. In the first region, it may look like you're here, and then I'm going to connect it. In the second region, it just goes down like this, right? In the third region, it suddenly goes goes something like this. So at the you know at the boundary, it is it is continuous, but it's not what. It is not smooth. Okay, it's not smooth, right? Because it, you know, it looks like this. Okay, it looks like it's not smooth. So then, you know, then it's time again to to ask yourself, right? What is your belief about the underlying true target function? If you think the other the underlying true target function should be smooth, okay? So if you have this belief, you think it should be smooth, then go ahead. Let's try to make it smooth. How do we make it smooth? I make the first. Or I make the first order derivative equal at the boundary, and then I make it the second derivative equal at the boundary, right? Because this is polynomial degree three, so I make both the first degree first degree uh, derivative and the second derivative the same at the boundary. Then we will have what continuous and a smooth curve, okay? A smooth curve, and that's something look like this, okay? So this green line is smooth and continuous at the boundary. If we make not only the y value the same, but also the the first derivative and second derivative the same, at the boundary, okay? All right. So this is what we will do, right? Again, suppose I have only one cut point, so I only have two regions. If I only have two regions, I do this: y is equal to you know this third degree polynomial, and then the second region is the third degree polynomial with you know x minus c as you know instead of x, right? Because we're you know in the second region. And, and I'm going to impose three different constraints. The first constraint is that y value must be the same. The second constraint is the first derivative must be the same, first degree. The third constraint is the second derivative must be the same. Okay? Now, once I do that, I have three constraints and I have two equations. I have two, two equations for the model. And I can solve my model. So, well, how many degree of freedom? Right? How many parameters do I estimate? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I have eight parameters in my original model. I put three constraints on it, so I only have five parameters. Okay? So basically, I only have five parameters to estimate. Now, it turns out that if you, if you solve the whole model, again, it has a very simple form. Okay? It's basically a very simple third-degree polynomial plus something that's x minus theta to the, to the q, okay? to, to a third degree, uh, added as an additional term with a plus sign here. Okay, with a plus sign, which means, right, which means it's zero all the way until the C cut point, and then it becomes a cube, like, and it becomes a cubic fit, okay? It becomes a cubic, cubic fit. So that's what x minus three to the, to the third means, all right? And so it turns out that it can be a very simple form of writing the final solution. And, and again, it is linear. Again, it is a simple linear thing you can solve using least square, right? Using least square, just like before, okay? Just like before, all right? So um, now uh, one more thing about the cubic spline. Okay, one more thing about the cubic spline is this. So if I have if I have you know if I have three regions, I'm going to make it continuous and smooth, right? I'm going to make it continuous smooth, okay? Continuous smooth. So what if I have three regions like this, and I fit a cubic spline and it look like this, okay? Now it may work fine, okay? It may it may be fine for my for my data points. So these are my data points. It may look fine. But then if I want to go beyond the data points, okay? So if I want to go beyond x, suppose suppose I want to predict my y value at the x value that that's that that's basically above or beyond my observed my observed x you know value range, I'm doing what I'm doing this is called a, a extrapolation. Okay, so I'm going beyond the observed range. Then this prediction is becoming something like this, right? It's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous that it goes this way. And here is the same. Here is, you know, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of ridiculous that it goes this way. 
Why? Because, why? because these are based on these values, but I'm trying to go beyond, right? And it becomes unstable. Because we're fitting a third degree polynomial, so it could be very pretty unstable, okay? So in order to make it more stable at the boundary, I want to make it more stable here and here so that we can go beyond. What people do is people say, okay, I'm just going to make it linear, okay? I'm just going to make it linear here and make it linear here, okay? So I'm going to make a third degree here, third degree here, but linear beyond our two, you know, two, two outermost uh, cut points, okay? In the you know, two outermost region, I'm going to make it linear just to make the, you know, the fit more stable. Now, that's also easy to do. If you do that, that's called a natural spline, okay? So a natural spline is a close cousin. It's a very close relative to the, to the regression spline. It's basically making the, uh, the cubic spline a little bit more stable at the boundary, okay? That's what it is. Now, if you want to do this in R, uh, it's also simple. So in R, what you, all you do is you, you basically import, you load a package called splines, and then you can use what? Well, you can use uh, BS and NS, two functions. And all you need to do is tell, tell this function, where is my cut point? Okay, where are my cut points? Because you have to tell the function how you plan to cut your x. Okay? You can cut your x, right? You cut your x into one, two, three, four regions. And you need to tell the function, where do you plan to cut it? All right? And you tell the function how many degree of polynomial do you want. So for cubic, poly, for cubic spline, the degree is equal to three. Right? Okay? So for natural spline, you don't have to do it because natural spline is cubic and linear uh, at the boundary. All right? So that gives us, so that gives us this kind of result. Okay. So this is our, these are the wage data we looked at last time, right? So this is the wage. Uh, sorry, this is the age. This is the wage, and I'm going to break my age into 25, 40, and 60. So I have one, two, three, four, four regions. Okay, four regions, and I'm going to fit a essentially a, a, a degree three polynomial in each region if I'm doing cubic spline, or if I'm doing natural spline, just have linear. Uh, at the outside, okay, at the outside. So that's what it looks like. Now, if your question is, if your question is, um, how do I ever decide how to cut it, okay? You know, so here I cut it into 25, 40, 60. How do I decide these are the cutting points? Well, many times you can decide by simply thinking about it, right? Because, you know, people, when people are young, you know, when they're, when they're below 25 like you guys, you probably don't have income, right? And then, and then, and then once you graduate from 25 to 40, that's, you know, that's, one phase of life, and then for 40, 60, there's another phase of life, and then you retire, there's another. So, so you decide cut points based on your, your understanding about the, about, you know, about, about the situation, about the problem, okay? So, so that's how you decide. But is there any way to, to, to let the data tell you how you are going to cut the data, okay? Just let the data tell you how to cut it. Well, that's hard, okay, that's hard. Why that's hard? Because that gives you too much freedom because you can cut it too many ways, right? You can, for example, I can cut it into 100 regions, and each region I fit a small polynomial, then you are going to completely, like, very accurately describe what the training data is, but then your model is too complex, and it's not going to generalize well, right? So that's, you know, that's what we have seen all the time. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not the more complex, the, the better. So how do you decide how much to cut the data if you let data tell you instead of you decide yourself, right? How do you do that? Well. Later on, we will introduce a method called trees, and we will do that, okay? But right now, for now, okay, we, you, you, will, you will have to tell the program, you will have to tell your algorithm how to cut it yourself, okay, instead of letting the data tell you. Now, more generally, okay, regression spline, more generally, is a kind of linear basis function. Okay? So we just said, oh, you know, everything we have been doing, the piecewise constant, piecewise linear, piecewise cubic, which is, you know, the, uh, the cubic spline. All these regression spline belong to a class of estimators called the linear basis function model. So linear basis function model is very simple. It's basically y equal to beta 0. So instead of x, we write it as beta, sorry, beta 1 phi 1 x, right? phi 1 x plus beta 2 phi 2 x, etc. Okay? Right? So as long as you can write your model into this form, it's called a linear basis function model. And each phi, each phi is called a basis function. Right? And the linear basis function model, again, is a, is a kind of feature transform. We're transforming our x into a z, and the z is equal to phi 1 all the way to how many, how many, however many phi you have, right? So that's, that's a feature transform. And if you transform into this way, it's called a linear basis function model. And each one is called a basis function. Okay? Each one is called a basis function. Um, okay? All right. Now, 
The other thing is that so far we have only been doing what? We have only been doing one dimensional problem, right? We have only been doing one dimensional problem. So this is H and this is the wage. So I use H to predict wage and then I can cut it off. Okay, I can cut it into several regions. But what if what if we have more than one dimensional problem, right? What if my X is multi-dimensional? What if I have many X, right? Many X variables. Now what if? I mean typically we have many X, okay? You, you very seldomly have a one dimensional problem. So you have x1, x2, x3. So for example, you have age, education, okay? And you know, something else, okay, something else. If you have several x variables, how do you cut it? How do you cut it? Well, you can still cut, okay? So suppose you have three x variables, age, education, and I don't know, um, you know, your income, your data, whatever, right? If you have three different x variables, then you can cut in your three dimensional space. If you have 10 different x, uh, if you p equal to 10, x equal, if x is 10 dimensional, you can cut in a 10, 10 dimensional space, right? You can do that. And that's again called trees, okay? That's again what you're going to do in trees. But we're not going to do it right now. We're going to do a simpler version. I'm going to cut each dimension separately and then join them linearly, okay? So that's give, that give you what's so-called, that give you what's so-called generalized additive model, GAM. So what GAM is going to say, suppose you have x1, x2 to xp, okay? You have many x variables. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut each x separately, okay? So for x1, I have this omega x1, omega x1, you know, forget about the, the notation. What I'm doing here is I'm going to take this x1, and I'm going to, for example, cut, like, you know, fit a, fit a cubic spline on x1 by cutting x1 into, like, you know, four regions and then fit this, all right? So I can do this to x1. And I can do a completely different model on x2. So suppose I do a just a linear model, simple linear model x2. And then I can do a completely different model xp. Okay? So, so the GAM is a generalized model. It's a, it's a very general model. It basically says that each dimension of x, in each dimension of x, I can fit a completely different model. And then I join all of them in a linear fashion. So that in the end, everything becomes a linear model again. Okay? In the end, everything becomes a linear model again. And we can solve it by O of s. Okay, by simple least square regression. That's a GM model. So for example, right? Okay? So for example, I'm going to still I'm going to model wage. I'm going to model wage as a, as, a, as a function of three variables. The first variable is year, the second variable is age, the second the third variable is education. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat them separately, okay? Separate each dimension. In the first dimension called a year, I'm going to fit a sing, a, a, a second order polynomial. Okay? Quadratic polynomial here. In the second dimension age, I'm going to do a cubic spline, okay? A spline, by, by cutting it into different regions, it can fit a spline. And then on education, I'm just going to do a simple step function. Because here, education has only four values. Uh, graduate from, uh, graduate from uh, middle school, graduate from high school, no, graduate from elementary, graduate from middle school, high school, college education, okay? So only four values. So I can simply just do what? To do a step function, like dummy variable, right? So I can just do that. So I'm going to basically, I'm doing different things on the three dimensions. And then I'm going to join them, link them together in a linear fashion, okay, linear fashion. And that, in the end, is still a what? It's still a big linear model. Okay, it's still a big linear basis function model. Okay, because everything here, right? Because a quadratic, right? Because a quadratic model, a quadratic polynomial is a linear basis function. A cubic spline is a linear basis function. This step thing is also a linear model. So, and then you join them linearly, in the end it's all linear. And you can solve everything by least square, okay, by least square. Now in R, okay, in R what you do is you use, uh, again, you use this simple function, you basically say LM is the regression function, right? You're going to regress wage on year, but then year you, you, you use a polynomial of degree two to model year. And then here for age, you use a, you use a, you use a, a, a cubic spline to model, sorry, a natural spline, okay? You use a natural spline to model age. And then education is just, you know, it's just education because it has only four, va four values. So we just treat it as a dummy, okay, for education. And then you just join them in, in a linear fashion and you can fit everything, okay? You can fit everything, all right? So that's a, that's a GAM, right? That's a GAM, okay? All right, so, so that, you know, that's a, that's a brief discussion about the things you can do using what? Using least square, right? So uh, all these models, these models are definitely not linear models. They're nonlinear models, but you can transform them into linear models by doing feature transform. And then, and then you can solve it using least square. Right? So that's, that's, all, that's a brief discussion about that. Now, 
as you can see, if you do GAM or if you do anything that we just talked about, you can make your fit very, very flexible. You can make your model very flexible. Okay? In each dimension, you can do whatever you want. And then you can cut it whatever you want. So your model becomes extremely flexible. Right? So you have a lot of freedom. Okay? You have a lot of freedom to decide how to model your data. But freedom is not free. Right? Freedom has to come as a cost. Right? So, uh, so nothing is free. So once you get this freedom, because flexibility, what you do is, again, you're increasing the complexity of your model so that your model becomes worse in terms of generalization properties, right? Okay? Um, okay, so there's always this bias variance trade-off or approximation generalization trade-off. And like we said, you know, recall this, right? This is what we said before. The difference, this is the VC generation bound, right? The difference between E in and E out, your in sample error, out of sample error, is this thing, okay? This is your generalization error. And this generalization error depends on your, on your, on your dimension, on your VC dimension. And the VC dimension, again, is your measure of the complexity of your model, okay? So the more complex your model is, the, the worse your, uh, your, your, your just so the, the more different your E and E out will be. In other words, the more complex the model is, whatever E in, the in sample error is, your auto sample error is much more different, okay? It's more different if your model becomes more complex. That's the cost of complexity. But there's a more interesting point here. The more interesting point is, what is the dimension, what is the VC dimension if you do feature transform, like, a, like what I described, okay? So if you do a cubic spline, or if you do a GAM, okay, GAM, what is the VC dimension of a GAM? What is the VC dimension? Well, you can measure the VC dimension of a GAM, or cubic spline, okay, you can do that. Okay? You can just measure that complexity, you can calculate the complexity, that's okay. But oftentimes, so here's the trick, right? First of all, when you transform your model from a simple linear model into a more complex model, your VC dimension goes up. The model becomes more complex. Your generalization error becomes go up, right? So your, your generalizing, your out of sample error becomes larger, much larger than your in sample error. So that's the trade-off, right? That's the trade-off. But your in sample error can go down, right? So the approximation generalization by a trade-off is your, if you use a more complex model, your in sample error goes down, E in goes down. But your E out, you never know, because the difference between E out and E in can go up. So that's the approximation generation trade off. Now, however, right, that's, that's only true. This is only true. Okay? This is only true. So suppose you choose a cubic spline. Then the DVC should be what? Should the VC dimension of a cubic spline model, right? But it is only true if what? If you decide to do cubic spline in the first place without looking at the data. So if you do not look at the data, you say, okay, I'm going to do cubic spline and I'm going to cut my age into uh, 25, 40, 60. You decide, okay, you decide this before seeing the data. If you do that, then your model, your, your finally you have this relation, where the difference between your E and E out depends on this VC dimension, the complexity measure of the cubic spine. But that's not what people typically do. Okay? What people, people typically do not, you know, do not choose what they want to do, do not choose their feature transform before looking at data. What often people do is they look at the data first, and then they say, okay, I'm going to do this. All right? So, so for example, right? okay? So suppose your data look like something like this, right? So this is x, this is y. Now suppose your data look like, okay. right, suppose your data look like this. Now, what people often do is they look at data, data first. And then they think, how do I model that? How do I model that? Do I model that using a linear one? Well, it doesn't look so good. So I'm going to change it into, into like second degree uh, quadratic, right? Do I model it with quadratic? Well, it still doesn't capture, okay? So what should I do? I'm going to, I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to cut it, okay? I'm going to cut into this region, cut into this region. I'm going to fit a linear here, fit a linear here, fit a linear here. Well, maybe that's still not good. So I'm going to fit a linear here, but I'm going to fit a quadratic here, and I'm going to fit a linear here. Okay, right? I can do that. Right? That's a, that's a, you know that's what I can do. When you do that, when you do that, your final model, okay, your and, and you and you settle down on your final model. The VC dimension no longer is no longer the VC of your final model. Okay. So let me explain. Okay. What you are doing here is this. What people when people do this, what they're doing is they are actually they they're, they're using their eye, or they they actually try to do it right. They're, they're fitting model one. Okay, they try model one first, like a linear regression, and they say, okay, that's not good. So I'm going to say goodbye to M one. 
And then, sorry, H1, okay, H1. And then I'm going to try my H2. That's my second model, all right? And then the H2 doesn't work. And I'm going to try H3. So they're going to try a series of models until they settle on the final model that looks good, right? If you do that, then in the end, okay, even, so suppose, suppose you choose H10, okay? Suppose you choose H10. H10 is the final one you choose. Then in the end, okay, you choose H10 and you calculate your E-in, okay? You calculate your in sample error. The question is, what is, what is your out of sample error? What is out of sample? Well, the out of sample error is in sample error, right? Plus this generalization error. And this generalization error depends on the VC dimension, the complexity of your model, but, right, of your model. But it's no longer the complexity of this model, of H10. It's the complexity of the union of all the models you have tried. Okay? Which means it's much bigger. It's much bigger. So your E out could be much bigger than your E. In other words, the final fit is much less reliable forever. Now, if you do not understand the intuition, right? If you think this is weird, why, why, you know, why is that? Let's go back to, um, let's go back to our introduction lecture, right? Okay. Okay. Recall, recall the simplest formulation of the generalization bound. This is the simplest formulation, right? And so the difference between in and out when h is finite, okay, when, if our model, if the hypothesis set is finite, then it depends on this, right, this absolute value h. This is the size, this is how many hypotheses is in the hypothesis set, right? And then we said what? Remember what we said at the time. Uh, if you have only one hypothesis, okay, so, so suppose you, you close your eyes, okay, I'm going to do this hypothesis. And then you go and you measure the e in, then the difference between e and e out are pretty tight, okay, the bound is pretty tight. If you choose from a very large set, you know, so if you have a very large set, I'm going to choose the one of the hypotheses that perform the best out of all this set in order to fit the training data, then your bound becomes a loser because you're essentially choosing, because you're essentially choosing from M hypothesis, right? And the M is here, okay, the M is here, this complexity. Now think about what we are doing here. What you're doing here is essentially you are looking at this data, and then you try model one, you try model two all the way until you settle on, you settle on model 10. So essentially what you're doing is you're choosing a hypothesis, not, not out of model 10, not out of model 10. You're choosing the best hypothesis out of the union of all the models, okay? So you're essentially, you're choosing from a much larger set than only H10, even though H10 is the final one you do, okay? It's the final one you do. You only, you, the final, you know, the final H10 is what you do, but you are choosing not from H10, you're choosing essentially from all these different models. So your complexity, right, the, the number of hypotheses you are picking from is much larger than simply what is in the H10, all right? So which makes what? Which makes your final result much less reliable. Much less, okay, much less reliable, okay? So, um, so what is the lesson here? Because there's a general lesson here. There's a general lesson here. The practice, okay, there's, uh, uh, if a person looks at, the general, the general lesson is, it's better to what? It's better to, it's often, most often, it's better to determine your model first, okay? Determine your model first before looking at your data. And then go and do it. And then go and do it. And then look at the E-in, like calculate the in-sample error, and the in-sample error will tell you a lot about the out-of-sample error because you fix your model first. And if you look at the data, and then pick your model to describe the data. Then your result will be less reliable, okay, less reliable, right? And this practice, and there's a, you know, there's a very bad practice. There's a very bad practice that some people do, which is they look at the data, and then they try 100 different models just to find the one that give you the best fit of the existing data. And there's actually a name for it that's called specification search, meaning you're searching for a specification. You're searching for a model that best describes the training data, or it's called data snooping. Uh, so basically, these things mean what? These things means you are trying very hard to choose something to fit your training data. And if you do that, the more you try, the harder you try, the, the worse your result will generalize into auto sample, into auto sample. All right? Okay, so, so that's, that's, the, that's the general lesson. Yeah, please. 
Yeah, increase R squared, right? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's just like it's just like what? Well, what you are saying? Let's try them out. Let's try a knot. Put another knot in. See whether it's significant, right? The result is significant. If it's significant, let's put it in. If it's not significant, let's throw it out, right? Is that what I'm saying? Okay. That's the same thing as saying. Okay. That's the same thing as saying. Suppose I have a linear regression. Okay. I have beta zero plus beta one x plus beta 2x. Now I'm, sorry, x, x1, x2, okay? Now I'm not sure if I should put this x2 into it because putting x2 into it makes the model more complex. Right? Increase R squared, make it more. I'm not sure what I should put this into it. So what you're saying is let's put it first, put it in first, and take a look if this beta 2 is significant. If it's significant, we leave it there. If not significant, we throw it away. That's what it's saying, right? That's, that's essentially a topic about what? That's essentially a topic of model selection which we're going to talk about next time, okay? So about next week, we we'll start talking about this thing. Now, the answer is, very briefly, the answer is choosing your model based on p-value or based on significance is not a good idea in general, okay? It's not a good idea. But we have a number of techniques you can use, which we'll talk about next week, okay? Not today, okay? Very good question. Now, all right, okay, so that's, uh, that's one, that, there's one final point I want to make, which is, uh, again, back to the point here. We are choosing, what I just said is that in our method here, you are what? You are choosing your cut point, okay? You're choosing cut point before, right? So you determine your cut point and then you do it. It's better to do that before because if you let data to, to determine for you how to do cut point, or more generally, okay, more generally, we talk about this basis function, right? Okay, we talk about you do this feature transform where you transform your x into all these different basis functions. And I'm saying that it's better for you to determine the basis function, to determine how you want to transform, what kind of basis function you want to use before looking at the data. In that case, your model is more stable. Your result is stable, it generalizes better than if you let, look at the data first and let the data tell you, you know, what is the, you know, what is the transformation you should do, right? That's what I just said. Okay, however, right, however, that's only however. Now, First, first of all, um, there's a term I want to introduce you. <clears throat> there's a term I want to use here, which is, um, which is there's a, uh, when you go from x to z, okay, and the z contains all your basis, you know, basis function, like like phi of phi one all the way to phi m, okay, phi m. So you're doing this when you do this feature transform, right? Uh, you are essentially turning you are essentially turning this old feature into this new feature. Okay, into this new feature. So this is like what do you know? This is like your old feature. Now once you do the transform, you no longer need it. Okay, because once you transform into z, you basically fit y equal to beta z. Okay, beta z. You you no longer need x. So x is like your old feature. Z is like your new feature. Okay, new feature. Now this transform process is what is you determine the transform process, right? You determine how to transform it. And in fact, all these processes, you determine what x is, because you need to determine what x is too, right? You know, because oftentimes you look at the data and say, okay, these are the variables I want to use. So you determine x, and you determine how to transform x. So all these things are determined by you, right? And there's a term, it's called a feature engineering, okay? There's a term called a feature engineering. Engineering, okay, feature engineering, meaning you decide, okay? You, you use your own knowledge to decide how to do this. What if, okay? What if you let data tell you? Now, again, you may, I just said this may be a bad idea, right? I just said this may be a bad idea. But you are going to do a bad idea. You're going to say, I want to I wanna learn, I want to I wanna let data tell me what is a good basis function. What, how do I do this transform, okay? So you want to you wanna essentially learn this data transform. And that's called a what? Feature, that's called a feature learning, okay? Feature learning, feature learning. Feature learning. So we want to learn how to transform it from data. Now, uh, this too abstract. Now, what I just talked talk maybe too abstract. So give you a, a, a sort of example I actually talk about in our introduction. Okay, what is feature engineering? Feature engineering is like this. You want to predict, okay? You want to predict what kind of uh, person people may think uh, is, what kind of face people may think is beautiful, for example, right? 
then uh, what are the x you should use? Like, what is the x you should use? Or what does the z you should use, right? What is the x you should use? Well, you, you should use what? You should use, suppose you measure a person's face. So you should use, one of the first things you should use is whether it's symmetric, right? Whether it's symmetric. Because we know, based on our knowledge, that symmetry is what people deem to be beautiful, okay? So you define symmetry. So what is symmetry? Symmetry is a what? Is a transform of your x, because x is just a measurement of like the face every point, okay? And you are transforming x into a z. This z is essentially whether it's symmetric, okay? Whether, whether the value is all symmetric. You, and this is called a feature engineering. You, based on what? Based on your own knowledge, okay? Based on previous knowledge, that you know symmetry is important. So you go from x, x is a measurement of all the face, and then you're engineering into, into you know, summarize it using symmetry or using you know, uh, you know, proportions that you, that you know that people think are beautiful. And then you, based on this new z, okay, you predict whether people find beautiful. The other way is what? The other way is you do not know at all. Okay? You have no idea what people think is beautiful. You have no idea what symmetry works. You have no idea you know, big eye works. Okay? You have no idea all these things work. So, so you're just going to what? You're just going to let your data, your algorithm, okay, computer algorithm and your data tell you, you just give it x. What is x? x is the measurement of every point on your face. And you just give it like, like a picture, okay, like a photo. You just give photo to the computer. Right? And let the computer figure out what are the features that people find what? That people find attractive. So you let your program do this feature trans transform okay? from using data. Now that is called feature learning. That's what feature learning. Essentially what feature learning does is using data to determine what these transform, right? Like phi one to phi, using data to determine what this basis function is, okay? Instead of you determine yourself. And that's essentially what neural network does, okay? That's what essentially neural network does. So, you know, all this deep learning neural network, that's what it does. Now, of course, I said that's a bad idea, right? I just said, if you let data determine how to do the transform, your result is going, not going to generalize very well, which is true, okay? That's why traditionally, neural network tend to overfit a lot. Right? Remember, when a model doesn't work, it's overfitting because you are, it's too complex. Right? There are too much degree of freedom. So that the model is too complex, you know, its generalization error is, is very big, so the result is very bad. Okay? It doesn't generalize well, it's overfitting. So traditional neural network is all overfitting. It's, it's a complete overfit, right? And uh, what people have figured out, okay? you know, in, the last, in the last 10 years, in the 20 years or so, is how to control that overfitting using uh, a technique called regularization which we'll talk about next week, okay? We'll talk about next week. So it turns out that, you know, if you let your data tell you how to cut your points and how to model the, the transform, it's typically a bad idea if you do not do anything else, okay? It's typically a bad idea because it's, it's, you're, you're, you're going to choose from two, you're making your model too complex. You're having too many degree of freedom. So the result is not going to generalize well. But if you use some additional technique, okay? Like a, like a regularization, which we're going to talk about next week, then you can control that overfitting and then make the result work for you. Okay, so, so that's some topic we'll, we'll discuss next week. All right? And uh, um, so that finishes my discussion.